the dude that bites. <laughs> and this is 420 as far as you know. <laughs> <laughs> as far as you know. <laughs> We're all drinking our, our white Russians in... Matt, uh, Mike and I are Judas priests, and this is my holy sacrament. Yeah. So, everyone, the dude abides. Cheers. Cheers. Be with you. Cheers. True to my nonconformist spirit, I don't have a white Russian. Definitely <laughs> <laughs> neither do I. You fucking anarchist. <laughs> Can't get them all to do anything the same. <laughs> trying to hurt cats. Today. They're doing really good. You know, like. Not on. The, not even on this holy. On this high holy day. <laughs> on this high holy day. Even if we all agree, somebody has to, to, to buck it. You know. Like. Uh, yeah. So. In case you didn't know, I'm Steve. This Bunny, <laughs> the dude. I don't even know who Bunny is. <laughs> the narrator, and John and Matt. <laughs> What's the narrator's name? Oh uh, man, I wish Did I could he have a name. Narrator. It's just like the cowboy, right? Yeah, yeah. he's just a mysterious stranger or something like that. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I can't remember the actor's name. I'd know it if I hear his name though. For sure. Oh yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, he was pretty. It's a Tom. No, it's a. It's not Tom Selleck. It's the other Western. Old movie western star guy. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so Riley, you I think you wanted to I wanted address to Matt's question from our last episode on religion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so after I gave my spiel on like religion and you know understanding God is reality or like reality is utmost or that which tr- most truly is. Um, you know, Matt was uh, asking, you know, is that, like, something that people have always believed about God, or is it something that has evolved through time and history? And um, it's an important question. It's a good question. And I think uh, the answer is ultimately, well, it's what people have always pretty much experienced God to be. Um, if you look at, like, the most ancient, archaic understandings of um, early man's experience with, you know, this thing we're talking about religion, um, they experienced, well, the numinous uh, experience of... Numinous? Yeah, the numinous. What's numinous? It means um, it's an experience where in which the individual has an awestruck experience of the wondrous glories of the divine and one's participation with it. And that goes back to the earliest times of man. So it it is pretty much um, how God's been understood since as long as man has been around. And of course... Is this pre-Hindu? It's Hindu and pre-Hindu, yeah. Okay. It almost sounds like we get noumenal and phenomenal from that, but that does... that's. We like don't get a lot of words from that area of the yeah. world, though. Yeah. yeah. Most, mostly Germanic, mostly. Uh, Latin and Greek yeah. is where we get most of our words from in English. Well, but I think some Latin, some, some Latin might be derived from Sanskrit. Yeah, it's a possibility. Could be. I mean, that's, that, that comes from the whole, like, in, um, Indo-European, European, right. like, language yeah. branch. So, yeah, which is a big... Which they branch, think yeah. they found, by the way, the, the where it connects. Oh, wow, yeah. cool. Yeah. And yeah. Rosetta, and Stone. Rosetta, I was say Rosetta <laughs> Stone, right? For more ancient language. So, yeah, I think that's the answer to that question. So what about, what about things like uh, the God helmet or entheogens or anything that alters your mind? Well, you have to understand that, like, I mean, obviously we're very connected and... Um, yeah, we understand our experience through the mind, so anything that affects the mind would affect our experience. So, I mean... Mentalism. Yeah. For those of, those of you at home, entheogens are psychoactive drugs. Yeah, it, the word... Broadly, I think it's plants with a human relationship. With a relationship oh, okay. With humans, broadly. Mm. But yeah, I think, like, uh, more specifically, I think it's used in those with a psychoactive relationship with humans. From my understanding of the etymolo- is it etymology yeah. of the word, <coughs> uh, it, it literally means the word generating the divine within. Mm-hmm. So it has, uh, in, within its name anyways, uh, you know, related to that psychoactive, um, numinous, inducing quality, so to speak. 
this plant may make you see some shit. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. Have you seen so what do you think the you relationship are? is yeah. between yeah. entheogens? Uh, would would marijuana be considered yes. an entheogen? Yes, it is. Okay. So this tobacco, so, strangely enough. It's a 420 thing. Yeah. So what do you think the relationship between religion and entheogens is? I think it's uh, very considerable. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are countless cultures that have used entheogens uh, since, you know, time immemorial to induce... Including the early church fathers. Including the yeah. early church fathers. No, I would not be surprised. Yeah. There is, yeah, um, There's some a theory on that. that yeah. all, actually, circumcision came from um, Somebody adherence to the mushroom cult. They had to have been tripping. <laughs> strangely <laughs> well, well, we were, we were talking mushroom. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> we were the Amanita muscaria in particular. Uh, you and I were talking earlier about how it's hypothesized that manna spoken of in in Exodus, manna was the bread from heaven well, that yeah, God Jesus. passed on to yeah. to the Israelites as they wandered the desert. What about the holy anointing oil? That can include cannabis, right? Right, a lot of like cannabis. six a pounds lot. of cannabis. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what I yeah it's, it's definitely <laughs> a part of the history of religion. Is entheogens? You can't escape it. I mean, and, and there's some, yeah. Uh, reported relationship between the uh, Catholic Church, the Pope, and the Cardinals. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, correlation there with the Amanita Muscaria. Absolutely. I mean, it's in the bloody Vatican, you know, foyard or whatever, courtyards. There's also a theory. The courtyard? Uh, What's in the courtyard? There's a statue of Amanita, Amanita Muscaria in both of its phases. Hmm. Or two of its phases. Uh, a magic mushroom. Ma it's a, a mushroom in yeah. The that's the red. Really? That's the red cap yeah, mushroom with white polka dots. White dots. It is actually in. Oh, that's different um, from the magic mushrooms, right? That's no, different it's from it's psilocybin. It's, it's, it's different from psilocybin. Oh. But it's but it is a it's magic mushroom. Right, right. But it, right. Is, it is an entheogen. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It has a what's the technical word for it? Doesn't matter. There's also as far as biblical, you know, the burning bush that Moses encountered. Uh, it's believed to be a. Acacia bush, bush mm. which contains uh, large quantities of DMT that they mm. could have extracted. That would for, make sense. Uh, or smoked as it burned. <laughs> or smoked as <laughs> it burned, yeah. The singing the name you of God. the bush. <laughs> and um, it's actually interesting, the Masons, on like their highest, uh, it's like a apron, and on their highest uh -huh. like apron, uh, there's like a picture, I believe, of the Acacia bush and the Ark of of Noah. What? Can we get our hands on some of this acacia? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically it ayahuasca. It, <laughs> it does. If you do ayahuasca, it has the DMT. Oh, is it? No, but the acacia Same. bush. Though. Oh, yeah. more, specific, more specifically? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ayahuasca is, is actually <laughs> two plants. <laughs> it's in, yeah, I thought it was the bark of something that they... They do, yeah, they do extract it from the bark, and I the used to know the, the, the botanical name yeah. for the plant, but uh, it escapes me right now. But yeah, there is... It, uh, it's an Australian tree that they... That they have like old stands of it, and people have been raiding them and take it, taking the bark off of them. <laughs> oh. yeah. Actually, I sprouted the seeds to them, and they didn't make it. Oh. But, uh, but so I wanted to see this acacia bush thing. And you're saying it grows around here? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it does. Yeah, no, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So you, oh, you go out to the desert and all that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's where people have always experienced the spirit of God, or it's a likely place for people to the desert. Mm. So, well, actually, according to uh, Jewish mythology, that's where Satan was sent, was into the desert. Yeah, with the, with the Zazel. Yeah, well, Azazel, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, oh, I Azazel was basically the, the, devil, the name for the devil in Jewish mythology. One of them, I believe. And then, uh, the devil's an interesting term in itself. I could do, but, um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, that quote in uh, the Last Temptation of Christ. He's like, he's going to the desert. He's like, why? He's like, because God's there. He's like, be careful. He's he's not alone out there. That the devil's there too. But yeah, which was definitely my. And experience isn't with that the where the devil tempted Jesus was in Absolutely, the wilderness? Yeah, the spirit of God came upon Jesus and he entered the wilderness to be tempted for forty days. But um, yeah, I can account to both being in the desert, no doubt. You know, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, we've been talking quite a bit about, you know, 
whether or not you know the origin of uh, you know the religions or mythology, how, however you want to term it, uh, you know whether or not they did uh, you know uh, mushrooms or, or you know smoked weed or or you know whatever varied different forms of entheogens, like we're saying. It, the more I look into it, the more I'm I'm convinced that of course they did. You know, because it's just it's so it's so weird. Like some of the stories that the way they're written down or, you know, or even probably older, like the way they're, they're, they're told orally, like it just, you can see where, to me that it, you can see obviously that the story's changed a lot, but even like the base of some of the stories, it's just so wild that it's like, of course somebody, you know, had done some mushrooms or something <laughs> and, and you had a weird trip and we were like, that must be what God is. Let me write that down, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, you know, and of course, you know, at, at that time where, you know, they're not as knowledgeable about chemical reactions and all that sort of stuff as we are now, of course you're going to take that and, and most definitely 100% sure believe that you had an encounter with God. Sure. You know, there's no way around it. You know, right. that's that's what you would think. So, so to me, like you know, people are like, oh, you know, they must they must have done mushrooms or something and like that. And people maybe th they are. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Matt mentioned earlier the God helmet. Are you all familiar with no, that? No. Yeah. So the God helmet is basically this experiment that they did, uh, where they attached a bunch of electrodes to a helmet that created different. Uh, electromagnetic fields and when worn when they would center the electromagnetic field around a certain part of the head a feeling of connection with the divine would happen even to the point where people would s actually see figures and things well that's what I'm thinking that the this, these psychotropic um, uh, drugs do they get us to the to God that of state. us to yeah. the God of us, and that's where I really believe that we're all God, and that we're just we're take we're taking all the crap away, and and we're getting to the God of us. We're the God. Yeah. We're gods. But the the drug or the helmet alters the way we perceive reality, so we see it in a sense more clearly in in terms of um, the presence of of the divine. Are you familiar with the study that shows, and it was fairly recently that mushrooms, psilocybin right. in particular, activate the same area of the brain that's activated during, during dreams. Not surprising. Yeah. And I've also recently heard that we use more of our brain in, when we're unconscious or sleeping. Yeah. Really? When we're, when we're awake. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That would make that sense. Is. That's, yeah. I want to see the. I want to see the personally. The, yeah. the studies it makes it yeah. makes sense <clears throat> based on the theory that dreaming is your brain dumping all its shit basically. Content. Yeah. All that's yeah as of yet recognized content. There's a lot Perhaps. of uh, categorizing it and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. An explanation for consciousness, perception, and reality that I've heard and I've, I've mentioned before to some people here is that basically the truth or reality is uh, a flat line and our perception uh, intersects that, fla that, that flat line, that baseline, in a wavelength. And so you hear uh, consciousness or the higher consciousness is, is a higher frequency. Wave, you know, so, right. so, so, so you, you, yeah, it intersects that baseline more frequently than someone who has a lower consciousness when it's, it intersects it less frequently. When in, I was online separately, and I found the Institute of Hermetic Philosophy, I think it was, and they had this little app on there that showed uh, a, a woman eating her cereal in the breakfast. And you could slide uh, this, you could slide the little like a little slider over towards reality or fantasy. And when you're over at reality, it's a static image. And the further you go to fantasy, you start to see these ghost images just barely flashing mm -hmm. over the woman eating breakfast. And then you get about halfway and it's like solid images and her eating breakfast every 10 or so images you see her pop through. And then you go over all the way to fantasy and she just flashes for, you know, a 10,000th of a second every 
three or four seconds you see her. And it just kind of, it was different, but it kind of uh, reinforced this idea of consciousness wavelength and, and, and hmm. interpretation of reality. Anyway. It's interesting. Yeah. It's really fascinating. So, like, the origin of, of like, the hermetic philosophy, I've never, I haven't really heard of it. So now I'm kind of curious. Like, to me, I'm thinking, like, guy, four-foot-long beard, you know, in a cave with the door sealed, you know. <laughs> Maybe himself drinking a white Russian or bowling with, like, you know, like, stalactites that he set up or something. But, you know. <laughs> I mean, so so where does that where does that come from exactly? I mean, are you aware of the sort of? Yeah, I found a book uh, that led me back to that, and I just investigated. And so he, the the founder of that just calls it. I think it's an op. He calls it an operative philosophy. Where okay. It, essentially, that hermeticism is a a philosophy that we can apply, mm-hmm. and I and I'm totally just right. just checking it out. So I can't speak to it with authority, but um. Uh, yeah, so. And it's interesting, too, how you mentioned the wavelength of, you know, a higher uh, vibration of consciousness right. expression would be, um, you know, faster, so there's more connection sites to reality, whereas a uh, lower one would be you know, slower, so there's fewer. And relating that back to, I forget the guy's name, but he did work on revealing um, when they were first able to map out DNA and connect DNA to emotions and how um, a person living in, in the emotion of fear, is, it's a slow uh, wavelength, so they have fewer sites to connect to, whereas a person oh. living in love, which is a fa- the faster uh, vibration, they have, they have more uh, huh. reception sites for their encoding their DNA. Yeah. Really? Yeah, that's wow. quite fascinating. That is. And that worked, like, just not, and I don't, don't want to beat that, uh, issue too much, but it, it like also how frequently you intersect that baseline of pers- uh, a reality, if you will, could be uh, whether you're tied up with fantasy or emotions because of the past or whatever, or it could be also if you just subscribe to bad fucking philosophy like solipsism or sure. or or you know whatever it might be. Um, well, you know the. I, I always thought of philosophy, you know, uh, not necessarily if you're if you're reading a philosophy, because I mean, just like reading something doesn't necessarily mean that you believe it. You're more looking into it or curious about it, whatever. But you know, a, f- a philosophy that you subscribe to or that you believe in, uh, you know, to be really an- analytical about it, that's like your software. You know, like right, that's yeah. what your brain's running. You know, yeah. Or you know, and every you know the how you interact with the world is, is like you know the, your 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 hardware is perception of reality. Where you know the, so it's a software thing. So I could see like you know if you're you know subscribing to you know a really you know harmful philosophy that's going to harm your 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 psyche too. Of course, over mm-hmm. you know over a period of time, you know the we could. You know, I I really feel that we're kind of getting into a relationship of calling like of we're kind of going into like maybe at one point or another saying that the state's a religion and I kind of and it is quasi religion. Yeah, I mean it does it does you know kind of meet all the markers of a religion. You know that there are there are either great men or great women that are held venerated above everyone else, and of course they're near perfect. Or, you have your martyrs like. Yeah. Martin Luther King. Yeah. <laughs> your Actually, idol, your you're, idols. You're more like your enemies, but like, your idols. You like have your Lincoln and and yeah, Washington. That sure. son of a bitch, man. You have your prayers <laughs> in the Statue of Liberty. Or not, I'm sorry, the uh, the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. Of Allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. You have your rituals. Oh yeah. At the ball games. Yeah. Et cetera. You know, and, and I think, you know, we're kind of saying that, you know... Your sacrifices? Yeah. Oh, dude, <laughs> yeah. yeah, your uh, sacrifices, your, your, you know, you have to go off to war to go. That's, that's one thing about people, like, oh, like, those backwards. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And men in robes, black robes. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you have men in <sighs> moo-moos, women in moo-moos, you know, they go, oh, there's a black robe. Wait a minute, what does that mean? Oh, they have a black robe on. Like, I have a plaid robe on. Like, I don't understand <laughs> why this is so like, no, I'm going, you know what, I'm going to go, on, I, I, uh, I'm going to go on to, like, with a choir robe one day. One of these yeah. days, I'm going to go to court like that. I'm going to do that's it. Just because, like, those are your priests. I've got one. I have one for you. I do. Oh, have to, oh, you know, that's so Next cool. time like I get the one, you wore, the one you wore to Libertopia. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully, I, I mean, I don't 
get in trouble again anytime soon, but if I do... <laughs> Wasn't that like a graduation? I, yeah, it's one? the same thing, though. That's the thing that's, that's really hilarious. So cool. It's the exact same that's thing. That's like going into the TSA yeah. dressed in a you, cross-dresser and demand yeah, like a woman to, to grope you. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's great. And also, getting back to you know, entheogens and its relationship, the relationship to religion, or the right. religious experiences, yeah, is something like half a dozen, I think, acid-like compounds exist within the human brain, not to mention in addition to those. Uh, By acid, you mean LSD? Yeah. Is, is that what I said? What I said? You said acid. acid. You said oh, acid. LSD, yeah. yeah. And then... Um, acid is also a form of... <laughs> right, yeah. And then... Form of... Compound. A base, yeah. Right, and then there's also uh, DMT, of course, in the pineal yeah. gland. And so, of course, if you, you also have, have your cannabinoids. Oh, yeah. Where are they located? There you go. In, in your brain? Just in the brain? And so. They're in your cannabinoid you know, system? Given the right yeah. psychological experience, any of those could become active. Sounds like we're making a case for cannibalism. Cannibalism? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is, read between Who's the lines. Who's Mike? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm kind of skinny. There's not really a whole lot of meat on here, guys. Don't get any ideas. We're lost in the woods. We have to resort to cannibalism. We've been lost three I hours. I got the brains. The brains. I'm still concerned for Matt. <laughs> Zombies. Yeah. Wow. I think somebody drove up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So then, um, yeah. He's getting rid of the feds for us. Ah, good, good job, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Someone's on it. Um, I also think uh, I wanted to touch on um, one of my favorite uh, theologians. Um, he's been called the philosopher's theologian, uh, Paul Tillich, uh, the 20th century. He uh, he considered you know the religious issue uh, as that he termed it in, in in the way of the ultimate concern. So like whatever the individual's ultimate concern is, therein lies their religious pr prerogative uh, in in his eyes. So like. Just to ask you guys, like, what is what do you think is most important in life, or like, what is the the ultimate concern for you? Uh, left to right, or are you, I mean, I mean, to, if there to, is one. Well, you spoke up first. Yeah, I was gonna say like, yeah, I just wanted to say something first. I mean, to me, I think, I mean, I say it like this, and I hate to use somebody else's phrase so many times, but it, but it's the most accurate one. Uh, I borrowed the phrase from the Free State Project. I've been looking for liberty in my lifetime. And to me, that is the most important thing because all the other things that are important in life, you can't have it to the fullest extent that you may want it. You know, you may have your different variants of what is the most, you know, optimum amount of love in your life, the most optimum amount of property, all these other sort of things. You can never get to any of those optimums really unless unless you have liberty to mm -hmm. the fullest extent that's possible within the human experience. Oh, you can Absolutely. Have it without liberty. Oh, I think, I mean, I mean, optimal though. I mean, well, without the optimal. ability. Yes, to that's choose. what I'm saying. Yeah, like, I'm not, not saying I'm not saying perfect. I mean, yeah. I mean, you could you could you could be uh, in love with a man or a woman in you know horrible situations. Obviously, I mean, for literary example, I mean, there's 1984 and that whole scenario in there, but. That's not optimum, you know. Right. That's not that's because they still couldn't fully love each other because they were in hiding the whole time. Well, you can love that love just is. Yeah, I was just gonna say you just universal peace and freedom. Yeah, you know, like yeah. is your ultimate concern. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can understand. Yeah, it's not a bad way. Yeah, I would say peace is the ultimate. Freedom's the way we get there. Yeah. Because with it's with peace yeah. that we get everything else. I like that. Yeah, not everybody's going to be like a, a philosopher or you know, a great contributor to science or whatever, but at least with peace and freedom, uh, everyone has the potential to you know, to rise, at least meet their potential, right? Right. I think if people can get to their authentic self, that is a kind of the starting date. Just You're authentic. just... So. Such a good little Hindu, and you don't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> all about the self and God and everyone. It's so cool to see. Really it's more <laughs> Zen Buddhism, isn't it? It's both. <laughs> well, Buddhism came out of Hinduism. 
Buddha was a Hindu. We can right. say Eastern spiritualism, then, basically. There you right go. Now. Sure. Yeah, and it's even there in in the undercurrents of the Western theological traditions or you know religious traditions. It's at, at the most highest level of those um, ways of thinking, you get the same the same perspective on the universe and you know humanity and our role and. It, that's, you know, the perennial philosophy that Aldous Huxley wrote on when he wrote that book and, you know, the, um, like the, the archetypal elements within, inherent within all, uh, you know, of the world's religions, I think it's to that, that kind of base core, yeah, that, that line. <laughs> Is that in The Divine Within? Uh, he, he talks, I mean, The Divine Within will, yeah, definitely talk about, you know, that aspect. But the, the perennial philosophy is book, a separate right? book. I gave you uh, The Courage to Be by Paul Tillich. Okay. It's worth, the title of the book is Worth the Price of Admission. It's really good. Mm. And then, um, yeah, so Perennial Philosophy is a separate book that Aldous Huxley wrote. It's really good, too. Um, yeah, I've been so terrible at getting to, reading. you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, you know, other than for school. Right, because you're in school right now, and there's a lot of reading involved with that. <laughs> how, how did your uh, spring break go? Uh, what did I do for spring break? I went to Disneyland for spring break. It's always a wise choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I, um, you know, uh, you mentioned reading, I don't have enough time. I'm having the, I wouldn't say exact opposite, but because the cops took my car. Um, <laughs> I to, stole your car. Stole, yeah, oh, stole yeah. my car. Right. Just, I have to take the bus away. Right. And so I'm actually like, I, um. So then you can't pick up a chick. <laughs> <laughs> or so you can't find love. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, this all is all relates. It's all relates. But, um. Going back to the liberty factor there, you know, folks. But I did, uh, I, um, burn through uh, Rights of Man, and I'm almost done with Age of Reason. Both of which are very good, but Age of Reason has a, a very unique flavor to it that's just really... I mean, it's still Thomas Paine, but it's, there's there's something he he's hitting on on a node there that he kind of like skirts around with with like almost every other writing he's done, but in Age of Reason, he really gets to the point of it. He's right? going to the jugular. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, so... That's just like your opinion, man. Just like your opinion, man. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a positive to having to take the bus. That was a lot of time for reading. You know, it does. I mean, they, I... I, uh, I you can thank them. Thank no, you. No, 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 I'm not. Well, no. Thank, thank you, masters. Not thank thank you, masters. masters. Not being thankful for... Kiss the, kiss the hand that feeds okay. you. Not being thankful for every situation, <laughs> peace. but being thankful yeah. in every situation yeah. is a powerful... Yeah position to take. I, I am very much the optimist despite myself sometimes, you know, like I really kind of sit there and be like... As hard as you try. Yeah, as hard as I try to not be an optimist, I always find myself going, eh, it's probably going to work out, you know? I like the term apocaloptimist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That means the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but it'll be all right. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> lies a great wisdom in itself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it is, it's like we need... Like, statism is a horrible fucking thing, but it's like we almost needed it to get to where we want to go. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like all of it happens for... Yeah. Me. It's all a step in the right. journey. Right, yeah. It's true. It's, you can't so be people can just let it go, though. You know, it's like, as we're moving... Right, you can't hold on go? to it. Well, can we create something... Great. Well, we've got that. genetic memory. Yeah. If you, you know, go that direction, it's encoded in us it's through memory, you know? Like, oh, you've been yeah, doing for it for sure. thousands fucking years, thousands of years, you know? So... Yeah. That's a big project to undo. Yeah, yeah but uh, beyond that, you know, status, uh, you know, genetic embeddedness is also, you know, what existed before the state, which was more akin to, you know, liberty and right. more of a communal, you know, everyone counts. And there's okay. Not this complete abuse. So here's a question. Mm. If we had sentient... Oh, no. Prostitutes, robots, sentient okay. prostitute robots. Do you think that they would develop a religion as part of their evolution? Probably, most likely. It'd probably be phallic oriented. 
Especially, <laughs> especially if they were programmed to acknowledge humans. And would they enjoy a white? And would they enjoy a white a white Russian? You know, just be uh, a, no doubt. Like, I mean, it's so long as they could handle those type of liquids, amongst yeah, others. I perhaps mean, they'd become dudists. <laughs> yeah, perhaps they'd become dudists. You know, I, I do. I could definitely see like I just had a vision of you know of some sort of android kind of smoking. Oh, uh, hold on, hold on, wait. Yeah. Cut. Damn it. Wait. It's too far. Man. We're out of time. We will get to robot sex one of these days. One day. One day. <laughs> the dude abides. Abide well. Good night. Abide. Peace. Wholeness. And I take... What does that say? What? I take solace in that. <laughs> I take solace in that. <laughs> Movie time. Movie time. Movie time. Movie time.